spread pretty thin and frequently pretty frustrated because of that. You know, we can see the stories out there. We just can't get to all of them. And that is, is really painful and it's a disservice to the community. Welcome to MCV Cast. I'm Aaron Murphy, Executive Director of Montana Conservation Voters. That was Gwen Florio, the former editor of the Missoulian newspaper. She'll be with us in a few moments for a very important discussion about the future of community journalism, especially in the wake of a very consequential election in Montana. We're tackling all of that today with Deputy Director Whitney Taney in Bozeman, Political Director Jake Brown in Helena, and Clara Stein with me here in Billings. Well, gang, let's start with the bright spot of the past week. The battle to achieve racial justice and root out systemic racism in this country. And the battle to save our planet by getting climate under control. Those are the encouraging words of President-elect Joe Biden. He promised a new era in the fight for our environment and our climate during his victory speech in Delaware Saturday night. Already, President-elect Biden and his team are preparing to transition into office after four years of an administration that set us backwards. And at the national level, we've got a lot of changes to look forward to in the weeks ahead. At the state level, though, it's a different story. It's no secret that Election Day dealt a severe blow to clean air, clean water, and public lands in Montana. It was, in a word, a game changer. But it also means this organization, Montana Conservation Voters, will have a critical role in holding our state's elected leaders accountable to conservation. We have a critical role in educating Montanans about the impacts of the choices our leaders make, and we have never, never been afraid of doing that. Well, that's the tough news, but Jake Brown, let's not lose sight of the bright spots of Election Day here in Montana. That's right, Murph. Despite the disappointing losses of our conservation candidates, MCB did play a significant role in the passage of Initiative 190 and Constitutional Initiative 118. Both measures to legalize recreational marijuana passed with pretty overwhelming support. We supported those measures because they allocate important tax revenue to public lands and wildlife. We're also pleased to report that 26 MCV-endorsed candidates won seats in the Montana legislature, and two MCV-endorsed candidates won seats on county commissions. State Representative Zach Brown won a seat on the Gallatin County Commission, and former MCV Chair Juanita Vero was elected to the Missoula County Commission. The city of Missoula also passed a measure to better fund the mountain lion bus system. Jake, a lot of focus now is on the incoming legislature, which is set to begin in January under the administration of Governor-elect Greg Gianforte. And you're tracking a draft memo about the agenda of the Republicans who will be in control. What does it say? It's pretty telling, Murph. The document really outlines the far right of the Republican Party's wish list. I would just mention that it's still a little early to know exactly how much of this document will actually be pursued as policy by the majority caucuses. Some Republicans have made statements that would indicate that not everything on the list will actually be introduced, but I think it tells us a lot about the bills that the new legislature will hear. Some of the priorities listed are putting a tax on renewable energy generation or eliminating environmental regulations, combining the State Department of Environmental Quality with the Department of Natural Resources, blocking future land purchases or greasing the wheels to transfer public lands to the state. And actually even more bills that would change the way that we do politics in Montana, like abolishing campaign finance limits or voter ID laws. Without a governor who will find compromise with the Republican legislature or to veto these extreme bills, this session is likely to be a wild ride. But we'll keep you posted about it throughout. Well, Senator Steve Daines beat Governor Steve Bullock on Election Day, securing another six-year term in the U.S. Senate. And Whitney, this is noteworthy as we continue following the funding for Montana's public lands and another missed deadline. In an unfortunate turn of events after the historic win for conservation via the Great American Outdoors Act earlier this year, the U.S. Department of Interior and the U.S. Department of Agriculture missed their deadline for the announcement of projects by a week. Thankfully, Senator John Tester wrote a letter to inform the departments of their failure to meet the statutory requirement to deliver the project list to the Senate within 90 days. As a reminder, the Great American Outdoors Act, signed into law earlier this year, provided full and dedicated funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which provides critical money for our public lands. Unfortunately, when the project lists were finally released this week, the Department of Interior missed the mark and stripped $13.3 million from two projects in Montana. Both denied projects would have increased access to our public lands in the Blackfoot River watershed and along the lower Mushell Shell River. 
In late October, a hundred hunters surrounded and shot into a herd of elk. Only three hunters were sighted due to the incident, which left 50 elk dead and countless others injured. This event left the hunting community shell-shocked, citing that incidents like these completely disregard the fragility of an ecosystem and give hunters a bad rep. This happened before Election Day, so the MCV Education Fund sent a letter to all three candidates running for governor, demanding that the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Department's law enforcement officers receive sufficient funding in order to bring justice to those who violate Montana's strict laws and codes surrounding hunting ethics. Governor-elect Greg Gianforte has yet to respond. The Montana Conservation Voters Action Fund endorsed three conservation candidates to serve on the Montana Public Service Commission, Montana's Public Utility Oversight Board. It pains us to share that none of those candidates won. In District 4, Western Montana, victory went to State Senator Jennifer Fielder, an outspoken advocate of selling off federally owned public lands. The Missoulian newspaper originally endorsed Senator Fielder, then retracted that endorsement after its editor resigned over the ordeal. And she is this week's guest. Gwen Florio is an award-winning novelist and an award-winning journalist. She's published several books, including Best Laid Plans, which comes out this coming February. And she's worked for newspapers all over the country, including the Denver Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer, then the Great Falls Tribune. She went to work for the Missoulian in 2007 and became the paper's city editor in 2016. Gwen, it's a pleasure to have you here on MCV Guest. Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we'll get to the issues in a moment. But first, thank you for sticking to your principles. And what are you up to these days? And what do you do for fun along the way? Ah, oh, I'm finally figuring out how to have fun again. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, I actually have time in my life now. I am uh, finishing a novel. I've got a deadline in a couple of weeks, so I'm working really hard on that. I'm doing a whole lot more hiking than I used to do. I'm doing some freelancing and then just kind of looking around and realizing there's a world out there beyond beyond the office. Well, that sounds nice. So you left the Missoulian quite publicly a few weeks ago after its editorial board endorsed State Senator Jennifer Fielder for the Public Service Commission. It's important to note you weren't part of that decision, but will you please walk us through what happened and what was going through your mind? Sure. Um, what had happened, normally I'm on the editorial board. Uh, there's three of us. There's the publisher, Jim Strauss, the editorial page editor, Tyler Christensen, and myself um, as the editor of the paper. And uh, we would meet weekly and discuss the issues and sort of the stand we wanted to take, et cetera. One of the things we do, we've started doing again, I'm still saying we, by the way, when I refer to the Missouli and I, I haven't quite detached yet, during campaign season is make endorsements. And what had happened this year is that our political reporter, Holly Michaels, was on a health leave. And obviously during this campaign season, uh, we needed to have that beat filled and we didn't have a whole lot of people who could do it. So I stepped in because I was then reporting on political issues. I stepped off the editorial board. So um, that's the reason I was not involved in the interviews or the decisions. However, I, you know, inadvertently put myself in a really tricky position because I was still editor of the newspaper and the newspaper made an endorsement that I just thought was indefensible. And I, because of that, stepped down. Well, despite the Missoulian's withdrawal of its endorsement and then its new endorsement of Monica Trinnell, Senator Fielder did win her seat in District 4 of the PSC by, I guess it was about 5,000 votes. How do you think this will affect coverage of the PSC in the months and, and years ahead for, for journalists? Boy, it's going to be a really interesting, I mean, the PSC has been really interesting for the past couple of years now. Um, it, it has been a pretty dysfunctional agency, kind of stunningly so. And I'll just be curious to see what it's like going forward. Um, I think the sad thing about what's happened at the PSC with all the, um, you know, intra-commission fighting that's been going on is coverage of some of the issues they deal with has fallen a little by the wayside. Uh, not much. Tom Ludy has been over from the Billings Gazette, has really been on them. But, um, you know, they deal with really important and phenomenally complicated issues. And I'm hoping that um, 
the coverage can focus on that again. I, I just don't know what the dynamic on that commission is going to be going forward. So you wrote that the one good thing that came out of the endorsement was that the community cared. What other takeaways do you have from Election Day from your perspective of someone who has had a front row seat in the media? Boy, uh, it's a lot. The, the biggest thing for me was the community cared. And I want to emphasize that, first of all, just because um, Missoula, as you know, is a really active, involved community. The Missoulians editorial page was where I turned first every day just for that community discussion. So even though uh, the paper really took a beating for the endorsement, again, people read it, people cared, people wanted their opinions known, and boy, did they make them known. Um, For the election, I just think it's fascinating that Montana went so red after so many years of purple. And, And I think I pointed out in the same story that you referenced that for years, outsiders would come in and write about Montana as though we were this crimson red state. And all of us who live here would go, but wait, (laughs) you know, that's not how it is. Well, now it's how it is. And so what I'm very curious about is to somehow figure out how and why that happened and, and what that dynamic is underlaying that. Gwen, that story that you're referencing was a, was a column that you wrote for The Nation last month called The Death and Life of Great American Newspapers, and we have a link to it in our show notes. It's, a, it's an important read, but for our listeners, we'd really like to hear your thoughts about the health of community journalism right now, especially when it comes to covering elections, candidates, government leaders, and, and states like ours that really took that hard right turn. Yeah, the the most troubling thing to me about what's happening in the newspaper industry, and I'm going to stick with the newspaper industry, sort of the traditional corporate owned newspapers, and and most papers in this country are owned by uh, large chains now, uh, some of them by hedge funds, which is a whole different and very depressing story. But what has happened over the years, as people are pretty familiar with now, is resources have been cut and cut and cut and cut, <laughs> just you know, unending rounds of cuts. And what that means is issues don't get covered as thoroughly as they could be. Just basic shoe leather, meeting coverage, um, all the things that sort of enable journalists to keep an eye on what's happening in their communities, their state government, and then write really in depth about it. I will say uh, the reporters at the local papers are wonderful and really hardworking and really care about what they do. And their overwhelming frustration is they don't have the time to do, there there just aren't enough of them to do all the stories that need to be done. So people are spread pretty thin and frequently pretty frustrated because of that. You know, we can see the stories out there. We just can't get to all of them. And that is, is really painful and it's a disservice to the community. So Lee Enterprises, a corporation based in Iowa, owns the Missoulian and several other Montana dailies, including the Billings Gazette. With their newsroom shrinking, as you just were talking about, even disappearing altogether, what do you think of the emergence of independent online news organizations like the Montana Free Press and the Missoula Current? You know, I'm really fascinated by that. And there's also a new one coming on the scene, State's Newsroom. Um, They have been covering, they've been putting reporters in state governments around the country uh, frequently reporters hired after they've been laid off or furloughed from their community newspapers. So you've got a bunch of really sharp, knowledgeable people in these communities. And I'm just wondering how that is going to affect journalism going forward. First of all, I'm, I'm thrilled to see all of these. I mean, anything that gives people more credible information, I'm all about it. As you've probably seen, the Lee newspapers can use the stories from the free press. Um, Kaiser Health News is another one I want to give a shout out to. They've really come on the scene in the past year doing a lot of terrific in-depth journalism, obviously from a health angle. Uh, They've also hired a lot of reporters who worked for other newspapers before. So again, you've you've got people with a lot of knowledge covering these issues. What it means, I'm not quite sure. You know, they are reliant on funding, whether the funding will always be there, I don't know. Um, they're all nonprofits right now, but at some point, you know, they they got to make money to support them. So I'm just not sure, but I'm hopeful. They make me hopeful. 
Gwen, what advice might you have for all Montanans, regardless of their political affiliations, who care about understanding objective truth about the world we live in? Where should they go? What should they read? Who should they trust? Who should they distrust? You know, my uh, bias is for what we like to call legacy media. And I think I have that bias for a good reason, uh, largely because, again, from papers like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, on down to the local papers, you've got reporters who've been covering their beats, covering their issues for a long time, and they're really informed. And their job is to inform people without taking a side. We like to say, you know, we all have our own personal opinions. They don't matter when it comes to our reporting. What matters is that we fairly represent the opinions and the positions of the people we're covering. So then the readers can can read that and make up their own minds. Um, what I would urge people to be super cautious about are these fake news sites. And I wish I had some names off the top of my head, but there's been there's easily half a dozen in the state. And the Free Press did a pretty good story naming them and, and outlining how they work but they are often journalists uh, in places far away that are writing almost to a script uh, handed down by the groups that fund them. So you have to really know where your news is coming from, you know, who's doing it, who's paying for it. So groups like States Newsroom, the Free Press, they've got their funding transparent. Um, You can look and see who is, is supporting them. And I think that's really important when you can't find that out, like back away, back away really quickly. So do you have any sense of the health of some of our smaller community papers like the Bitterroot Star in Stevensville or the Valley Journal in Polson? And what's your advice to them or consumers of them as journalism changes? I don't have a sense as to their financial health. I mean, even again, at the papers like the Missouli and the Gazette, you know, the, the Bozeman Chronicle, I thought when I came here, the wisdom at that point still was papers in smaller communities were really healthy. Uh, Because no one else is going to report on your prep sports teams. No one else is going to report on your city council. Well, now someone, you know, again, for one of these bogus news sites can sit in in their bedroom in who knows where, Albany, and zoom into a Missoula city council meeting and write about it from a particular point of view. That has to affect community journalism. The biggest thing that affects local journalism is advertising or the lack thereof. As it keeps going to the internet, uh, that cuts into the funding. You know, advertising is what pays salaries and pays for the trucks and pays to have the paper printed and all the costs that, again, come with traditional journalism. And that is going away fast. And as much as I'm really angry about how resources for the actual journalism are being cut, you know, I reluctantly understand that if you don't have the money, you can't pay for it. I would just say I'm really concerned, and the best way people can support it is by continuing to subscribe to those papers, whether online or in print. And, you know, people got used to getting their their journalism for free online, and they get mad when they have to pay for it. But I always say, you know, if I go downtown to hide and soul and want a pair of shoes, oddly enough, they expect me to give them money uh, (laughs) because (laughs) they need to pay their employees. And and the same works for news. It costs a lot of money. You know, good journalism is really labor intensive and and it costs money to support it. So if um, even those subscriptions don't provide the bulk of uh, funding for newspapers, they're really important. Gwen, as an alumnus of the University of Montana's School of Journalism, I have to end things on a note of hope. Given all the turbulence in this world of journalism and and its changes, what is your message for aspiring journalists, especially ones in Montana today? Oh, man, go for it. Um, It's still more fun than any other job. That's what I try to tell them. It's like you can make no money and work horrible hours and have no personal life. But everything you do, almost everything, is going to be really, really interesting and fun. And it's so much better than sitting in a cubicle doing, you know, something that will probably make money and give you a retirement fund and all the things that we we should want. But um, the the best thing is we we get uh, UM interns at the Missoulian. I also am going to be teaching again at the J School this semester. And working with young college journalists is one of the world's best experiences because they're so smart and they're so hungry. And every time I'm around them, it totally renews my faith in the future of journalism. 
Well, we appreciate all you've uh, given to the industry and to the state in terms of uh, information and um, appreciate your principles. Gwen Florio is the former editor of the Missoulian newspaper and a longtime news reporter and editor, also a novelist. Check out her work at GwenFlorio.net. Gwen, thanks for being on MCV Cast. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. The views of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of MCV, its staff, or its board of directors. And again, we invite our listeners to check out Gwen Florio's column in The Nation. There's a link to it in our show notes. Northwestern Energy has announced plans to withdraw from its intent to purchase an additional stake in Coal Strip Unit 4, citing unfavorable regulatory decisions by the Montana Public Service Commission and the Washington Utility Commission. The decision by Northwestern came weeks after the Montana PSC declined to let the utility recover $5.7 million in costs ratepayers would have to make up. The big bill is associated with a two-month period in which Coal Strip was unable to operate because it was failing to comply with federal mercury regulations. To make things harder for Northwestern, the Washington Utility Commission was putting pressure on Puget Sound to not sell its stake because Puget had not demonstrated that the sales are in the best interest of the public. It may appear that this potential sale is finished, but I wouldn't celebrate quite yet. I would not be surprised if Northwestern Energy tries to pursue legislation that will force the PSC to comply with their demands. We saw a bill like that in the 2019 session that died right at the end, so I wouldn't be surprised if they tried something like that again with our new state government. This week, the Crow Tribe elected a new chairman. Frank White Clay defeated incumbent A.J. Not Afraid for the Crow Tribal Chair. With a new chair, the entire Crow executive branch will have new people. It's worth noting the Crow citizens have been upset with Not Afraid for his close alignment with GOP leaders this election cycle because they believe President Donald Trump does not have Indian country's best interests at heart. We're very excited to announce that our new MCV Education Fund website is up and running at mtvotersedfund.org. Please check it out for yourself to learn more about MCVEF and see how you can help support our mission to engage, empower, and educate all Montanans. Thank you, Clara Stein. Clara is our intern, and she's wrapping up her internship with us this week. Clara, thank you for all you've done for us. We're glad you're with us in this fight. We'll leave you today with a clip from National Public Radio. Host Noel King interviewed the Dalai Lama this week about his new book called Our Only Home. It's a warning about climate change, and the Dalai Lama's words resonate with all of us. We'll see you next week. This planet is only our home. Now, recent information I heard on moon also some water, but we try to settle there Impossible. (laughs) So, therefore, now we have to take care about our own planet. It's logical.